Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session, Astrophotography Joyride, a newbie's perspective, going to be presented by Molly Wakeling. But as always, before we go into that, I do want to show off our image of the week, which um, another image by Diego Colonello, uh, NGC 6188, what is this? The uh, Seagull Nebula, correct? Uh, I believe that's a seagull. Um, great image. Uh, this is with his 10-inch F4. So uh, very uh, fast uh, Newtonian, I believe. Um, or maybe it's a type of Newtonian. Uh, that said, uh, as always, uh, thank you for posting uh, or for submitting, Diego. And uh, you guys can uh, hover over here, click that to submit your own. Check out the images that have been submitted or the images that have won. Uh, that's all I've got here. Taking my screen back. Oh, I got that down now. All right, so uh, Molly is in the room. Molly, I'm going to uh, hand the camera right over to you. There you go. Uh, you are live. Hi, uh, I'm glad to get the chance to speak on this channel. My name is Molly Wakeling, and uh, I've been in the astrophotography for about three years, and uh, really excited to to share my story tonight. Um, let me hop over. Let's see, why did that switch tabs? There we go. So I got a little bit of setup to do, and pull up my uh, PowerPoint here. Take your time, and I'll, I do want to remind everyone, uh, first of all, in chat, ask your questions, and I'll call them out to Molly. Uh, I believe she has a two-monitor setup, so she's probably going to see them live, but um, I'll still uh, interrupt her if she misses one. Uh, and uh, if you are not, uh, if you're asking us what chat, we're not monitoring YouTube chat, go to our website, theastroimagingchannel.com, see the bouncy thing on the bottom right? That's our chat. Click that. You'll get in. You'll be able to ask your questions see what other people are talking about. That's it. And there we go. Perfect timing because I see Molly's screen. All right. Uh, so, actually, I got to zoom out my notes here a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, I got started in astrophotography in July of 2015. So, uh, just coming up on, on a theory, three years. So, it's been a very exciting three years to learn this new hobby. Um, I uh, started out with a Celestron Next Star. Let's see. Where's my? There we go. The Sushan Next Star 8 SE that was given to me as a gift. It's a long story. <laughs> uh, it's on a. Uh, uh, it's, a it's an 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrain on a single fork arm out as mount. So if you're unfamiliar, I've, I've invited a bunch of my friends to this that talk. So if they're unfamiliar with uh, astrophotography or astronomy, out as means altitude azimuth. And it moves up, down, and left, right. It was a very generous and thoughtful gift. From my now ex-boyfriend, but uh, yeah. So uh, the first night, I took it out with with my friends, and it took a few attempts to figure out exactly how to align it, put it in the wrong time zone, <laughs> fix that, and then slid over to Saturn and focused it. And wow, it was totally mind blowing to see Saturn just in your face when you've really only seen it as a little dot in the sky before. So that was very exciting. And so my first thought was, wow, this is awesome. And my second thought was. I have got to get a picture of this. <laughs> so uh, it didn't take too too many nights for me to figure out. Uh, I put my camera, my DSLR on a tripod and aimed it down through the eyepiece to try and get a picture of Saturn. And uh, here's my very first astro photo, this beautiful picture of Saturn right here. <laughs> uh, so uh, on, on each of the slides, I'm going to say which, which night uh, was uh, I took this picture, took the picture that I'm showing on. And the date. I've been keeping an astronomy log since day one, which I'm very excited to, uh, very glad that I did that. And I recommend that you do too if you haven't started a log, definitely start one. Um, so I got online the next day to figure out how I could better attach my camera to my telescope. And uh, I started messing around with, I figured out I needed a T ring and a T adapter, started kind of messing around. And uh, about a month later, succeeded in taking my first deep sky image, the Lagoon Nebula. So this was trip number seven. Took several attempts to get a fairly stable image because of what I would learn later was periodic tracking error on the 
uh, on the telescope mount makes the stars kind of jiggle around. Uh, but this is one of the more stable ones of the image set that I took, this one minute long frame. It was really exciting to see something that I couldn't see very well with my eyes, but the camera could see quite well. Um, and I, I, took, I tried taking these single frames of a bunch of other objects as well, uh, such as uh, here's the cat's eye nebula here, this little blue dot there, which I couldn't tell was a thing at first. I looked at it on my computer later. I'm like, oh, that's bigger than a star. That must be the nebula I was looking for. <laughs> uh, so it was, of course, pretty terrible, but still really cool to just to see what I could what I could image with my camera on this telescope. I'd also tried stacking my images in Deep Sky Stacker, but they came out really dark and weird, and I just couldn't really feel like I was figuring that out. Uh, so I tried stacking images again the following month. Let's see, oh, yeah, this is another one that I uh, was trying to take with a single frame. And uh, the single frame with the dumbbell nebula here. <laughs> so you could see it, which was very exciting. Uh, so this is one of the first stacks that I did about a month later in August of the Andromeda Galaxy. You can see it's it's terrible. <laughs> uh, 29, 30 second exposures at a stupidly high ISO that I do not recommend. Um, and I didn't have a whole lot of success stacking at first, but kept trying and uh, would take hundreds of subframes in hopes of just getting a few dozen that were stable enough to stack because I had, again, a lot of problems with periodic tracking error. Made a lot of mistakes. Sometimes I would shoot in JPEG instead of RAW. Um, sometimes I get really dark images out of Deep Sky Stacker and have no idea what to do with them, setting the ISO way too high, et cetera. Uh, started learning, then I started reading more online forums, reading some books, sort of figuring out that I needed to take some calibration frames, uh, darks, flats, biases, things like that. Um, learned how to align the telescope better. And occasionally things turned out in my favor. I started getting some encouraging results. So I got this, uh, what I now see would say is a, is a bad picture of the Dumbbell Nebula, but at the time it was a very exciting picture of the Dumbbell Nebula. Uh, I could see a lot more detail than I could with my eyes, so I kind of that as a win. Nothing worth framing yet, but enough to kind of keep me going. Um, so I used to go home after about, after about one or two in the morning and process my images right away because I was so excited about how they would turn out. In uh, this image, for instance, uh, I still had a lot of trouble. This was 18 frames out of some 125 I took that night because I had lots of periodic tracking error with this, with this next star mount that I was using. Um, then I finally got to image the Orion Nebula for the first time as fall rolled around, and that was a very encouraging result, which is this grainy mess right here. <laughs> but <laughs> it was so cool to see, like, I couldn't, you know, when you look at it in the eyepiece, you can't see these reds, you can't see the, uh, some of the detail, at least from my fairly light polluted location and smaller telescopes. So it was really cool to plug the camera in and get these, see, see stuff with the camera that I could not see with my eye, especially since I was still just kind of getting started in, in astronomy. Um, so this was only six of some 180 frames that I took that were stable enough to actually stack, but this was a lot of work. Um, and it was so beautiful and awesome that I imaged it again and again and again. <laughs> I tried imaging other things, but they just weren't coming out as well. And I was so fixated on on the Orion Nebula, and I came up with, with my own hashtag, uh, ridiculously photogenic nebula, <laughs> just like the ridic ridiculously photogenic, I think it was dude or something like that, uh, a, a meme that was passing around the internet for a while. <laughs> Finally, after several months of kind of doing this on my own, one of my friends convinced me to join our local astronomical society. And went to my first members' night. Couldn't make it the first meeting, but went to the first members' night out at our. We have we have an observatory, and uh, it was it was while I was there that I received this amazing text message from my uncle, who he'd been feeling the astronomy bug, biting again with the pictures I'd been posting. Was looking to upgrade his setup to the Mead LX850 because he's like made of money or something. I don't know. So. <laughs> Um, and he wanted to give me his, his Celestron CGE 1100 setup, which is a Celestron 11-inch McCassegrain on an equatorial mount, so much better type of mount for doing astrophotography. 
and uh, he wouldn't even let me pay for the shipping. So I was just absolutely floored. Um, let's see. There we go. This is what that mount and telescope setup looks like here. After uh, This is a picture after I got it set up sometime later. Uh, so I got it all and set it up, and uh, it was quite a steep learning curve to learn how to use an equatorial mount, but I uh, was very encouraged by some of my early results. Um, so this this was this was first light, just a five second frame. I could see almost as much as I could on my eight inch uh, uh, with because uh, I was able to use a focal reducer. He'd sent me a focal reducer with it, which um, basically concentrates light more into the pixels, you could say, and I'm able to to have more light gathering capability onto the camera chip in a shorter amount of time. So that was that was a huge bonus as well was getting that focal reducer. And then I finally started getting a really nice image out of that. This is still only 30 second long images, but uh, with the equatorium out being a lot more stable, I was able to get more of them and having the focal reducer, I was able to um, gather more light and have a wider field of view as well. Uh, so uh, this really kind of started getting me going on, uh, you know, when I started to get a little bit discouraged on the setup I had before, now I was really ready to go. Um, so, but unfortunately it wasn't long before I started having some trouble. So sometimes the go-tos on that mount would just be really off. The mount sounded like it was having a hard time slewing at times. Sometimes it would seem to hiccup. I tried all kinds of things, wrapping the battery in a dew heater to make sure it was warm, checking the balance, whatever else I could think of. Uh, however, sometimes it still worked pretty great and I was able to get some other nice images as well. Um, this is one of uh, Bode's Galaxy that needs a little bit of color correction, but you know, it's it really, really neat to be able to get pictures like this in my first year. Um, the Whirlpool Galaxy with the, uh, I didn't have good field flattening capabilities at the time, so a lot of field unflattening, but still, this is a really cool image, <laughs> the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, yeah, so I also, uh, this is actual quote from my log on, on this image here. <laughs> uh, I love keeping a log. Uh, so yeah, so things uh, moved along uh, swimmingly and I started having fewer instances of the problems I was having as the temperatures warmed back up. So I figured I would just deal with it the following winter if it happened again. Uh, so I was doing a whole lot of outreach events, and so I was using my 8-inch a lot more for these outreach events because it's just so much easier to set up than the 11-inch monstrosity on its on its big heavy mount. So bring out my 8-inch, and uh, but then I figured out that I could do some really cool planetary imaging on that mount. So um, this was the first one of the first moon uh, stacks of the moon that I that I made. So I took a video and picked the best images called uh, Lucky Shot Imaging, where you take a whole bunch of images and a program called Registax selects the best ones, does some magic, and you get this great image at the back, at the back basically, is the short version. And uh, somebody pointed out to me later that I got this really cool thing in the in, in the picture called the, the Lunar X, which I'd never heard of before. And uh, apparently it's a, it's a pretty, uh, not rare phenomenon, but one that's hard to catch because you can only see it for a couple of hours during first quarter. And uh, so, uh, one of, one of many miraculous moments throughout my short astrophotography career so far was catching the Lunar X on my first try, so go figure <laughs> without even trying. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's see. So, yeah, yeah, there's Lunar X. And uh, uh, also trying uh, to shoot Jupiter with my DSLR. This is all with, by the way, this is all with my, with a Nikon D3100, uh, which is uh, like basically an entry level Nikon DSLR camera that I already had in, on hand because I got into DSLR imaging a few years before that. So again, got lucky. Hey, look, there's a great red spot. Awesome. And got a, uh, a fairly decent picture of Jupiter. So that was pretty fun. Um, so uh, I've kind of given up on DSLR planetary imaging because it tends to get some really weird edge effects that I think are a result of, of the compression since my, my camera only takes HD video and not full frame video. And I, the format doesn't actually work in Redistax. So I have to convert formats. And I think there's just some weirdness that happens. I get these weird edge effects here. So I've kind of stopped using DSLRs for planetary imaging. Um, moved on. I've started using my guide camera for planetary imaging, which I'll show some results of that later, which came out pretty awesome. 
Um, yeah. So onward from there. Uh, oh yeah, another note on the planetary imaging. So um, quick aside, uh, don't think that your planetary imaging data sucks because uh, it'll look terrible until you process it. I was at a at a local star party and was talking to a gentleman who had some webcam video he'd taken of Saturn, and it looked you know grainy and and kind of dim. And uh, he was like, "Can I do anything with this?" I'm like, "Well, let's give it a shot." So we pushed it through Registax, and at the end of Registax came this awesome image of Saturn that you would not have expected from this really terrible looking video taken with a webcam. Uh, so don't throw your data away. Uh, even if you think it's bad, it could actually be good. It just takes a little bit of massaging to bring out the goodness. So that was a big lesson I learned. Uh, and I hold on to all my data. I have two and a half terabytes already. I've only been at this for less than three years. So <laughs> get some hard drives. <laughs> uh, all right. So then there was that time I almost discovered a supernova. So in the long chain of, of uh, happenstances that I've had so far in my short astrophotography career. So this was a... Uh, admittedly kind of terrible image I was taking of M65 and M66, part of the LEO triplet back in April of 2016. And then I was imaging that same region about a month later. And I heard a couple of days after I took that image that, that somebody had discovered that there was a, a new supernova in M66, which is the galaxy at the top. So I went back and looked at my data and sure enough, there was a new little dot of light inside of the galaxy. <laughs> Uh, M66, uh, taking the, uh, when I took from my May data set as opposed to my April data set. So now I kind of want to start looking at more of my galaxy data every time I take galaxy and just see if I can maybe get lucky and discover a new supernova. So that'd be really cool to do sometime. Amateurs do discover these things a lot of the time. So uh, don't, uh, don't throw away your data for that reason either, because <laughs> you, might, you might have something in there, even if the image, is, if image quality isn't that great. All right, so um, I spent the rest of the summer trying to figure out how to do this fancy thing called auto guiding, where you attach, if you're unfamiliar, you attach a small telescope to the top of your large telescope. This well is one way to do it. There's another way to do it. but uh, And then you get a small camera, put that on the back, and it basically kind of acts as, as an optical feedback system for your mount. You can you plug your mount and the camera into your computer. There's this really cool program called PHD, which is uh, short for push here dummy, because literally just push all these buttons and it just kind of works as magic. Um, and that basically corrects those periodic tracking errors in the mount that I mentioned before, which um, with those errors, I can't really image longer than 30 seconds, even on this really nice mount. Um, but, but with guiding, there was the promise of being able to image for much longer amounts of time, which allows you to collect more light on the things that you're imaging, which allows you to get much better images. But it took me a long time to figure out all the problems. Um, you know, there was, First of all, acquiring a scope and a uh, a small and a guide camera. Then there was figuring out how to set up the software and figuring out why I was getting all this gray static on the image until somebody told me that it'll do that until you're in focus and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so once I got that figured out, um, sorry, let's see, look at my notes here. So in, in the process of figuring that out, I started having some troubles again with the mount, and I finally kind of figured out something was wrong with the cables. So I tried swapping out the cables, tried out some different things, because the mount was still, every time, if I would touch a cable, it would it would jump, it would start slewing uncontrollably, it had just some really weird behavior. Um, but on the nights that it did work, uh, even though I hadn't gotten the auto-guiding figured out, I still was getting some really nice images. So this is uh, uh, Messier 20, the Trifid Nebula. So this is a stack of 30 second long images from a fairly light polluted location. I image from a place that's yellow on the Bortle scale, if, if you uh, are familiar with the Bortle scale. So it's like um, a little bit out of town, but not really outside the light dome. But still able to get some kind of nice images. Uh, and this one as well of the Eagle Nebula. If you're unfamiliar with that region, the um, the weird structure kind of in the middle of that pink region there are the pillars of creation, which is that famous Hubble image that you may be familiar with from the 90s. So it was really exciting to get to see that because uh, it's definitely almost impossible to see from, from where I live, and it's hard to see even from dark locations. But camera picks it right up, which is very exciting. Um, so then I tried something else in the meantime as well. I tried using my guide scope as an imaging scope. So I'll plug my DSLR into the little scope that's sitting on top of my, of my big telescope, that little white one that I showed you earlier, um, which is an Orion short tube 80, if you're, in case you're curious. 
Uh, and I got this nice image of the Andromeda galaxy. So that little telescope is achromatic, so it has chromatic aberrations, so there's little blue halos around the stars. But with a little processing, you can make that look pretty nice. So that was exciting to finally get a nice image of the Andromeda galaxy. This must have been my 10th or 11th attempt at it. And finally got something I was, I was happy with uh, out of that telescope instead of trying to image it out of my uh, small field of view Schmidt cast grain. Uh, so, I mean, that's a $100 telescope and, you know, a, a cheap DSLR camera. And yeah, the mount's nice, but this is only a 30 second long image, which you can get with, with most mounts uh, on, on the, with that type of telescope. So uh, if you are afraid of spending money to get into astrophotography, tiny cheap refractor and a little DSLR on a semi-tracking mount will get you somewhere. You can get stuff like this, so just goes to show. Um, so finally, in early September over Labor Day weekend, I had my first success in guiding. So this is a three minute stack of three minute long images, only about 10 of them of the Crab Nebula. Uh, my excitement from my log, I, I posted on this photo as well. <laughs> I was very excited to be able to see the filaments on there. That was, that was, that was pretty neat. Uh, so finally had some success with guiding. I got the telescope to talk to the computer, got the camera to talk to the computer, um, figured out how to focus that guide camera. I needed to uh, star diagonal, put it too far away. I couldn't, couldn't get it into focus, but uh, just putting it directly in was too close. I couldn't get it into focus. So finally, I just took, my, um, took the Barlow off of my Barlow and used it as a little extension tube, and then I was able to get perfectly into focus. Um, that weekend as well, so I started to take, tried to take, okay, now that I got three minute images, let's try five minute images. And I got what is hands down my favorite dumbbell nebula image, but uh, it took some processing to get it exactly how I wanted it. So first, the first time I stacked it, it was so bright that the core actually looked kind of washed out and grainy and terrible. So I probably picked some wrong settings, so, but I didn't know that at the time. So I just took a single frame and processed it on its own instead and got a fairly nice result that, that I was pretty excited about. So this is a single five minute frame here. And then I got better at processing later on and I reprocessed it and got this much nicer image of the Dumbbell Nebula out of that same data set. And then our local astrophotography expert uh, helped me process it a little bit more and I got an even nicer result where you can really kind of see the red X there. And this is all from the same data set. So, um, as much effort as you put into acquiring the data, you should also put a lot of effort into processing your data because the, the photons, the beautiful structures are there. You just have to pull them out and bring them forward. And that takes, uh, that takes as much, if not more effort than actually acquiring the images. Uh, and that's, that's really where some of the magic happens. Um, so uh, things went along swimmingly. I was, uh, you know, now that I was guiding, I could image all kinds of stuff. So started getting some really exciting results. Uh, this is the fireworks galaxy taken in November, and the horsehead nebula with some uh, some lens flare from all the tack over there. Couldn't quite get it out of the frame. And then I tried uh, putting it onto uh, imaging through the uh, the guide scope again as an imaging scope now that Orion was up and got a really awesome image of the Orion Nebula as well, uh, taking one minute long exposures. Um, so, but I also have my fair share of failures in that meantime, and those were all the good results. I had lots and lots of bad results too. You can see we're on night number 70 now. So um, I had this uh, failed attempt at a mosaic of an inch telescope. Uh, I thought I had that sixth frame there, but somewhere in my, uh, during a, during the meridian flip, geometry got messed up in my head and that square went away. So, uh, hey, look, I fixed it with paint. <laughs> it's good enough, right? <laughs> so I'll probably try that experiment again at some point. Um, yeah, so about this time, I started uh, getting the mount issues that I was having the previous winter started happening again. PhD was giving me non-orthogonality errors. The mount would just suddenly lose alignment and not know where it was going. It would jump or start swinging out of control if I accidentally touched one of the cables. The right ascension axis wouldn't slew far enough, all kinds of stuff. 
And I eventually figured out something to do with the cables. Celestron, for goodness knows what reason, installed, like, they decided to use these shielded Ethernet cables to convey the signal from the electronics portion of, of the mount to the actual mount motors themselves. And they decided to use these shielded cables because the right ascension axis actually needs nine pins to convey, like, to convey all the signal and the ground. But uh, Ethernet cables only have eight. So they used the shielding as a ninth pin, which was the ground. So when it was a little cold outside, the metal would shrink, and any any little touch on that cable, or, or even really thinking about touching the cable, would cause it to lose contact. And without a ground, the motor would slew uncontrollably, it would lose alignment, everything would go crazy, and it was caused a lot of very frustrating nights. Then I heard about this guy named Gary Bennett, who lives up in Canada, who, like me, was probably fed up with his CGE mount and decided to create this mod kit to replace this cable with a much more robust screw-on type cable, which incidentally is now the exact cable that Celestron is using in their new mounts. So uh, it's a much better cable. So I bought the mod kit and got to work that December. Oh yeah, here's a picture of the mount I was gonna have up during that time. So, um, here, so I took the mount apart and the, the installation really wasn't that hard, mostly unplugging and replugging in cables screwing in new connectors uh, to replace the old ones. And then after I finished, turned everything on and uh, turned the power on and had it start finding the switch position. And the right ascension axis was slowing uncontrollably again. Um, so I spent the next two months pouring over everything, pulled out my trusty multimeter, checked every connection, got a set of schematics from Gary Bennett and checked every little thing and could not figure out what was wrong with this mount. Finally defeated, I contacted Dr. Clay Sherry, who's a mount expert and performer of the supercharge service. And I was hoping he might have some insight. He was phenomenal, gave me a whole bunch of advice on things to check, experiments to try, but still had nothing. Finally, in March of 2017, uh, yeah, I shifted off to Dr. Clay. And he spent about a month throwing every resource he had at it, even taking it to his lab at the University of Arkansas to check it out with their electronic diagnostic equipment. Even he could not figure out what exactly had blown up when I did the Bennett mod. <laughs> so he sent it back to me. But another miracle occurred in my long slew of miracles here. He had just received a Celestron CGE Pro, successor to the CGE mount. Refurbished from Celestron, it had been hyper-tuned previously, and he said he would sell it to me for a steep discount. So I slept on it, and then I accepted the offer. My only concern was that it was a lot heavier than the CGE, and I thought it might cause me to not use it so much. This later turned out to be true. Uh, so pretty much I only use it at star parties and long weekends now. Um, but he shipped it to me, and I got it just in time for the Texas star party of 2017. But I'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, with all these issues going on, uh, my, my astronomy club had recently acquired um, a, oh yeah, here's the, here's the CGE Pro mount that he shipped me here, all set up at the Green Bank Star Quest. It's pretty, pretty beefy. I call this the beast. Uh, so um, my astronomy club had recently acquired uh, a resource that at least belonged to one of the club members, which is this five inch Vixen Neoachromatic Refractor. In, inside of a backyard dome that was located on the property of the observatory. Um, so I uh, is on a Lasmondi Gemini mount. And uh, after some trouble in figuring out how to use that system, finally got it up, got it up and running. And honestly, I've gotten some of my best pictures on there. <laughs> uh, so I've been using that resource quite heavily. And uh, it's been, it's been uh, really awesome to be able to, to use that. Let me show you some of the pictures I got on there. Uh, so this is the Flame and Horsehead Nebula, slightly out of focus, but um, uh, a lot nicer than, uh, de definitely, it's a larger field of view, so I was able to, I'm able to do a lot more nebula on it than I could on my, on my schmidt category, which is much more meant for a lot smaller targets. So it was really exciting to get to image this region finally. Um, but then I captured in February, what I consider to be my masterpiece so far, the Rosette Nebula. Uh, I'm very, very proud of this image. I, when, when it came out of, uh, of Deep Sky Stacker, my jaw absolutely hit the floor. 
and I've been doing pretty all right as an early astrophotographer, but this was just absolutely mind blowing. Uh, even with, you know, I, this is an unmodified DSLR. I'm in a fairly light polluted location. Uh, and it was just, I was so excited to see this. Uh, I actually won uh, second place in the Astronomical League's uh, Imaging Award Deep Sky category last year. So uh, I want to do a, a quick aside here, emphasize that, uh, again, uh, spending effort on processing your images. So this is a single frame of that image. Tons of light pollution. If you zoom in, it's really noisy. You can barely even see that there's a nebula there. I had to really kind of zoom in on my tablet to see, like, am I even, like, looking <laughs> anywhere in the vicinity of this nebula? Did the telescope actually take me there? Uh, and then when it came out of Deep Sky Stacker, it was still fairly noisy. Colors were all weird. Uh, very, like, lots of light pollution still in it. But then with some additional post-processing and Photoshop able to pull out its real potential, get all those photons that are really there, just kind of buried in the noise of the image. You have to if to play games to pull them out, but they're really there. It's really your data. It's, you're not adding anything. It's it's real. Um, so throughout the rest of the spring, the weather didn't really, really cooperate. Uh, so I'll just skip ahead to the Texas Star Party, my very first Texas Star Party, which if you haven't been, is totally worth the long drive. It is incredible. The skies are mind blowing. You can see here with the Milky Way, <laughs> just uh, just totally totally awesome. So I brought. Not only my 11 inch monstrosity on the CGE Pro that I just acquired, but I borrowed a Celestron AVX mount that I borrowed from my minion, who is a, uh, a then high school senior named Michaela, who I was mentoring in astrophotography, who I am mentoring astrophotography, and uh, general, uh, she's majoring in physics. I, would, I also majored in physics, so uh, that stuff as well. I brought, uh, I was given by a, a club member a, a Borg 76 millimeter apochromatic refractor, which is another really awesome gift I got from a very generous friends and family. <laughs> um, so I hadn't had the opportunity to use it much yet, but that AVX mount turned out to be a perfect mount for that telescope. So I had two rigs set up and boy did I have a ball. The CGE Pro worked phenomenally, the AVX worked phenomenally, and over the course of six, gorgeous dark nights. I managed to image 23 separate targets. It's astrophotographer's heaven. <laughs> uh, so uh, so this is so some of those are the needle galaxy here. I was able to take six minute exposures or longer because I didn't have all kinds of light pollution totally blowing out my frames down there. Um, so this is my my DSLR. Uh, I didn't so I discovered that the Borg has a bit of is not the flattest field. But it was it was encouraging to see how much light and color could gather nicely and not have all the blue haloed stars. I later on, got a field field flattener, and you'll see some of those images later on. I also grabbed this nice image of image of Jupiter uh, with a borrowed uh, ZWO ASI 120mm that I also borrowed from Michaela, who'd been also given it by another club member. I have lots of borrowed gear. <laughs> uh, we, there's some nice clear, steady atmosphere down there for sure. Uh, for this one, I piggybacked my DSLR on top of my Borg refractor and was able to get some nice long exposures of wide fields of the Milky Way. So you can see the Lagoon Nebula there, the Triffid Nebula, a couple of globular clusters, just uh, a couple of open clusters. Very beautiful region. Probably some of you um, uh, visual experts out there can name even more stuff than I can. Uh, and one of my favorites from that trip is this image of the Whirlpool Galaxy taken through my 11 inch with my DSLR. Uh, this is only eight frames because the sun was coming up. But uh, I, I, when I when I was there, there was a guy who had a 36 inch daub down there with I mean, the mirror weighed like 700 pounds or something ridiculous. He like had like a little crane on the back of his truck just <laughs> to get it off the truck. Uh, but I got to look at this and it was like looking at a picture looking at it through this enormous Dob under those really dark skies. And I was like, I like my plan for that week was to only image things that were hard to image from home. But I was like, I have to image this. And I'm so glad that I did because it just got so much detail. Uh, and uh, it was very exciting, very exciting image. Uh, so I got home from Texas and continued to image at a furious pace, made heavy use of the club's refractor, and uh, started to look back at what I achieved in my first two years of astrophotography. I'm continually amazed uh, 
by the fact that I have such generous friends and family and how technology has, has enabled me to take, to, to do this at all. Like, so the astrophotographer, our expert, I keep mentioning, uh, he, he was imaging back in the days of film when you had to sit at the telescope and, and guide yourself for hours at a time, keeping that star centered and then hoping that uh, something wasn't going to come through your frame or you weren't going to mess up and your film was going to come out. But I can just take all these short exposures throughout the bad ones, keep the good ones and process it. And, you know, it only takes me uh, one night of imaging and an hour or two of processing and I've got this great picture. <laughs> so uh, definitely really appreciative of the technology that's allowed me to do this. Because uh, if you look back, um, this is, this is, you know, again, that, that, that one minute frame of the Lagoon Nebula. I took one of my first nights out. And then just two years later, I was able to take this image of the Lagoon Nebula. Uh, so, um, you know, technology and great friends. And, you know, I was able to pick this up pretty quick. Just, I mean, this is trip number 92 in, in less than two years time. So getting out there and just going again and again and again to work out all the problems. Uh, definitely let me get caught up in this in this field pretty quickly. Uh, so I also did a lot of, uh, let's see, no, I'll skip ahead there. Okay, so Summer pressed on and continued to get really exciting images. And then I attended the Green Bank Star Quest, which was also fabulously dark. And we had two nice clear nights. Um, I brought my minion, Michaela, with me, and she started to get some really nice images then, too. She finally got guiding figured out on her rig and got this really nice image of the Andromeda Galaxy, which I have to admit is better than pretty much all my images of the Andromeda Galaxy I've taken so far. Uh, even though she took it on, on the uh, Orion short tube, which is an achromatic refractor, again, you can still get really cool looking images on the, and it's, it's like 120 bucks, I think, you know? So <laughs> um, there's some uh, really awesome stuff you can do some of that beginner equipment for sure. Um, let's see. No, there we go. Um, why did that do that? Oh, I'm, okay, sorry. Uh, so I did a lot of uh, outreach during the summertime as well. So, uh, so a lot of the nights uh, that I have logged in my log are outreach nights as well. So this is my eight inch, which is again, a great, um, uh, a great uh, outreach, like quick setup visual observing telescope this was a we had a cassini farewell party last september when when we crashed cassini into saturn and it ha just happened to peek out from behind the clouds long enough for us to get a good look at it so uh did a lot of outreaches i do a lot of outreach as well uh later that summer i made my way out to casper wyoming for the solar eclipse uh, and for astrocom which is the astronomical league's annual conference and i brought another female astrofem with me sarah one of my coworkers. And uh, we had a great time and a great eclipse. This is us holding packs of eclipse gum that they passed out at the conference, which was hysterical. And <laughs> we, of course, had to get a picture with it. So I brought out that Borg refractor with a, um, uh, just a Mylar solar filter that had come with it uh, from one of, the, one of my fellow club members, my DSLR, and my Nexstar SE uh, mount, which is the same one I used, my eight, that was just the one that came with my 8-inch. I had lots of advice told to me and to crowds, you know, when I was at uh, events we were talking about the eclipse. If it's your first eclipse, don't take pictures. Just, just enjoy it. Just get out there, be in the moment. I'm like, yeah, that's great. I want to take pictures. So I practiced for months uh, setting up that scope on the back porch, uh, seeing how long it would track the sun for, testing and debugging a backyard Nikon script. Uh, which I very carefully timed to capture all the events that I wanted to, relying on online guides for exposure time and ISO settings. And the plan was to switch from a partial phase script of a few images every five minutes to the totality script at one minute until second contact. About a half hour into the partial phase, the unthinkable happened. My tablet crashed. I quickly revived it and restarted the partial phase script. I still have plenty of time till totality, put it in the shade of my telescope case because it had overheated. And then, of course, Backyard and Icon decided that would be a great time to re-authenticate one of the phone home to make sure I was not using it illegally or something. So luckily, the medical center where we were set up at had made their Wi-Fi available to us. So the day was saved. I was able to get back into Backyard and Icon, still have plenty of time before totality started. About one minute to go with my heart pounding. I hit the start button and then turned my attention to the eclipse itself. So while my camera was running pretty autonomously, I was still able to enjoy the eclipse. I wasn't messing around with the camera. I did the thing that everybody said you should do, which is just like, like boggle your mind at the eclipse. 
So still got to do that. Then uh, after totality ended, it took me a minute or two to come back to my senses and walked over over to my camera to see how my images had come out. And uh, I almost forgot to put the solar filter back on, but luckily no damage was done. <laughs> Saw bright light coming out my viewfinder. I'm like, oh my god, threw the solar filter back on there. So I hit the review button, started looking at my images, and almost fell over because they were so perfect. So <laughs> here is uh, second contact. Uh, again, another quote from my log because it was just such an exciting moment. Uh, for me, being so I, I've been a shutterbug my whole life. I bought my first camera when I was uh, about eight years old, a little 110 Crayola camera I got at Target for $13 after saving up my allowance for a couple of weeks. And uh, so for me, capturing a moment is, is is tantamount to experiencing the moment. And I think I was actually more excited by how my images came out than by seeing the eclipse itself, <laughs> which and it was kind of weird, but that's that's how much into this I am. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so we have a diamond ring here, the corona here. Um, you can see some of the, the really cool details in the corona. Uh, we did have a little bit of, of thin, high clouds, which I think was actually the contrail from the Eclipse Chaser. So that's cool. Those people got to see it in the plane, but it kind of ruined it for the rest of us. <laughs> um, and I uh, did manage to get one frame with Bailey's beads. Unfortunately, using Becker and Nikon, I could only take one frame every two seconds because of uh, USB timing issues, I guess. I don't entirely know. But I did manage to get one with Bailey's beads. And it was cool because we had some really nice prominences that day, too. Um, so uh, that, that was really exciting. Um, and then after I got home, I started doing a little research on how I might be able to combine my images to make one of those really cool high dynamic range images of the corona. I found this interesting procedure known as the pellet method that had been around since the earliest days of Photoshop, back when people used to scan their print images and then edit them. So I'm told, stone ages, stone ages, man. <laughs> so it took me about an hour of radial blurs, subtractions, multiplications. But at the end, I got this really awesome image of nine frames ranging from one four thousandth of a second to a quarter of a second with two ISOs uh, with lots of really cool detail on the inner and outer parts of the corona. Unfortunately, the prominences got covered up because as the moon moved across the surface, it um, created some... Uh, um, like if I had made, if the moon disc that I put in this image was smaller, you'd see kind of these weird edge effects. I fortunately the prominence got covered up a little bit, but, uh, man, that Corona <laughs> and that blue color is, is the blue sky, uh, which surprised me. I didn't think that would actually come through, but, um, the longest exposure image I took, uh, which is, uh, the quarter second image that I multiplied this image by, you could see the blue sky. That was really neat. Um, uh, and this, uh, one, Astrobin's image of the day on September 4th. So another exciting moment. Uh, so that fall, uh, I've started to feel like I was nearing the limits of what I could do with a DSLR. Uh, DSLRs have some problems like noise and not being able to capture red very well and, um, uh, and, and some other related problems. So I borrowed an SBIG ST8300M from a fellow club member, which is monochrome cooled CCD camera, one that's made for astrophotography. Cooled is a major part of the benefit here. Uh, I'm always dealing with high levels of noise in my DSLR images, uh, but uh, it being monochrome and it being a CCD are also contributing factors, but really it being cooled was, was a huge bonus. Um, but it being monochrome, I had to learn some new techniques, which was imaging with filters. So uh, at first I just practiced using it uh, without any filters. I, well, I had a, a light pollution filter so I could block out the, a lot of light pollution and the infrared and the UV light and stuff like that. Um, but got some pretty neat images. This is again on the on that five inch refractor that's owned by the astronomy club because instead of taking an hour to set up my gear, I could just be out there in 20 minutes, which was which was great. So uh, especially great on, uh, on weeknights when I had to be up at work early the next morning. So. Uh, monochrome luminance image of the Dumbbell Nebula here. Uh, monochrome luminance image of the Andromeda Galaxy with all kinds of fabulous detail and, and cloud uh, dust dust lanes and things like that. Um, I, I quickly learned how time consuming it was to collect all four channels that were necessary: luminance, red, green, and blue. Um, and uh, I, I was, so I tried to 
when I was trying to use the, I had these filters that was also that were also given to me by another club member, and uh, that's when I kind of was figuring out that it was difficult to uh, took a long amount of time to capture all the colors. But I also started was having a really hard time color balancing these, and I, I couldn't figure out why. Um, and I finally learned that they're not actually red, green, blue filters, but they were photometric BVR filters, uh, which have a, a similar but, but different spectra than regular RGB filters. So it's probably contributing to my inability to correctly color balance these images. Um, so I took the prize money that I won from the Astronomical League Imaging Award that I hadn't said what I was going to do with yet, and I bought myself some nice astronomic LRGB filters that I have totally since fallen in love with. Um, so again, during this time, like, uh, had some, had some misfires, more misfires, finally some success. Uh, this is with, um, the new astronomic filters, uh, that I just gotten. So a little bit better color balance. This is the Pac-Man Nebula here. Um, and, you know, had some weeks of bad weather. So this one actually had to get imaged over two different nights. Um, but uh, as, as spring rolled in and I got my tax return, I finally <laughs> bought the camera that I've been saving up for for about the last year, which was the ZWO ASI 1600MM Pro. So that is a, uh, a cooled astrophotography camera, but it's a CMOS chip instead of a CCD chip. Now CMOS chips, if you're unfamiliar, are the ones that are inside of DSLR cameras, um, those point and shoot cameras, uh, cell phone cameras. and Historically, they've not been as high quality or as low noise as CCD chips, but because of the intense pressure on the cell phone camera market to be able to capture good low light images, people would like taking pictures of themselves dancing in the club when there's no lights on, then CMOS chips have really come a long ways. And there are actually several CMOS chips that have lower noise than CCD chips. And that is the case of this camera. It has 1.2 electrons of noise uh, I can't remember which which gain setting that's at, but um, uh, that's uh, that's their lowest level, um, and it shows. It definitely lived up to its promise. So of course, you know, new camera, got to image the Orion Nebula, kind of how it goes. So this is through that that Vixen refractor. The um, the A the, the chromatic aberrations are a little more evident uh, on that with the filters and they are with my DSLR, so you see all those blue halos, but focus on the detail of that Orion Nebula because it's because there's so low noise, I can get such better detail than I ever could with my DSLRs. It's just like I, I, I'll blow it up full screen, like the TIFF image on, on my computer and just, and just look at how awesome the, all the gas streamers and the dust lanes and everything is. And, um, yeah, it's is definitely it was definitely worth it, and it's a great kind of it's it's a lot cheaper than some of those higher end CCD cameras, but uh, definitely a great place for to start with with Astro cameras for sure. It's got some phenomenal reviews on on cloudy nights, and uh, for good reason. Um, so let's see where did I leave off? Uh, yeah, so the rest of the spring was spent. Uh, the rest of this this past spring was spent doing a lot of outreach because. Uh, a lot of cloudy nights, been busy. Um, but uh, it's also pretty good at solar system objects too, which I'll do from my uh, backyard sometimes. But um, this is this was taken, um, I think this was done, uh, yeah, this, is, this, this, this was probably on my eight inch, I think. But um, yeah, so it, it's got a really high dynamic range. So I've been able to get some really nice pictures of the moon. Uh, this one as well. This one must have been done on the uh, on the Vixen refractor, actually, with that large field of view. So here you're seeing the Earth shine and then the really bright crescent area, which is the same area as I imaged here. So really high dynamic range. Uh, um, I took some uh, data on Jupiter. Didn't put it in here because uh, it's still the seeing wasn't as great as it could have been. But uh, really looking forward to using it. It's USB 3.0, so you get really high frame rates as well, which is great for planetary imaging because you can get more frames inside of those moments of good atmosphere. Um, okay, so Texas Star Party. Went again this year because it was so awesome last year. Again, set up two rigs, but um, they're both mine now. I bought myself an AVX in September, and I've got my big 
CGE Pro monstrosity that I brought down. Um, I actually started having some trouble with it at, at, a, at a local star party I went to back in September. Go figure. I thought those issues were done. I still was having some trouble with it at Texas, but got at least a little bit closer to a solution. But the AVX worked great, especially with that Borg mount on it. And uh, the Borg the Borg scope is, is so lightweight that I actually had to buy a microphone boom stand counterweight because uh, the other counterweight was too heavy. <laughs> so that's my one clever addition was uh, using that instead. Um, so even though um, uh, the big mount wasn't working so well, I did manage to get uh, some other images that week by using the, the Borg. Um, so this was this is the Snake Nebula, which is a, a dark nebula that um, pretty much would be impossible to see from my home location, but uh, fantastic to image down in Texas. And this is with my DSLR, actually, this image here. Um, so that was really exciting. A minion got a really nice image of that, too, with her Orion short tube, uh, Michaela. Um, I also brought down that SBIG that I'm still kind of borrowing indefinitely because I had the ZWO connected to the 11 inch because I was taking some short exposures on that, um, even though the, to kind of overcome the mounts problem. So this is with the SBIG here of the Swan Nebula. Then, of course, the Milky Way wide field mounting my DSLR on top. These are some of the ZWO camera images I got on the 11 inch. Um, I was having a couple problems, but you know, this, I mean, this, these are. This is like only a, a three minute frame. It's usually kind of a hard thing to image. Uh, a couple of four minute frame or a couple of um, one minute frames on the Whirlpool Galaxy. Now this one's kind of neat. Um, so this is the ring nebula as you might recognize. Um, and you'll see that this is only 12 30 second images, but I was able to get this magnitude 15 galaxy <laughs> in the image. So again, showing the awesome power of that, of that ZWO camera. Uh, getting that super dim galaxy with uh, fairly short exposure times. Um, another Texas Star Party image of Markarian's chain. This is with my um, this is with the S big on my Borg refractor. Here's the black and white inverted version to see just how dang many galaxies I was able to capture down there with that setup. And then of course a nice reminder that you can do astrophotography without a telescope whatsoever. So this is I have a Vixen Polary that I got at last year's uh, astronomical league conference and uh, during the eclipse, and it let me take these one minute long exposures. So I took seven panels, and the Milky Way is just so awesome down there. I think I actually I think down in that lower region is actually a air glow, which I hadn't captured before, so that was exciting as well. Um, so yeah, that's that's my story. Lots of joys, lots of heartache, a mountain-sized dose of perseverance, and several major and minor miracles. In the last nearly three years, I've ventured outside with a telescope 142 times, which is an average of 50 nights a year for nearly one night a week. This is a hobby that requires dedication, patience, and willpower, but the results make all the hard work worth it. I got into this because of my burning desire to share the beauty of the cosmos with as many people as possible. Sure, you can Google a Hubble image any day of the week, and get images that are always that will always be more incredible than anything we can capture through Earth's mushy atmosphere. But there's something special about knowing that the jaw that the jaw dropping image came from just a regular person down here on Earth with a day job, a telescope that you could pack into a car, and an off-the-shelf DSLR. If I have one word of advice, it's never to give up. The data you thought was bad might actually be great. It just needs some processing. You might think you can't image with a cheap DSLR, an unruly Schmidt Cassegrain, and a single fork arm Altaz mount with the worst backlash ever. But you totally can. With some practice, okay, fine, a little money, and a lot of luck and sweat, you can capture the beauty and the magic of the cosmos and share it with the whole world. So thanks. <laughs> That's my spiel. Uh, also, I have a, um, uh, if you want to see more of my work, uh, I'm on a couple of social media sites, I've, my Facebook and Instagram. I keep a blog that describes how I actually do all the stuff. So if you want to see um, it and I have no idea how to do it. I have some tutorials on how to do things as well as I, I just upload my log there as well. Um, if you just want to track my exploits. And uh, I'm also on Astrobin as Molecule. Awesome. Very cool. Um, I First of all, the whole story felt very familiar. 
<laughs> because I think a lot of us have gone through that, and particularly your uh, law, uh, your uh, quotes in your log, uh, <laughs> the excitement. It's like, oh my God, I did this. Oh, I'm so blown away that uh, I was able to do this, and uh, <clears throat> yeah. Throw in a week's worth of failures. One success makes it all worth it. Actually, a month's worth of failures. One success, and you're you're blown away. Um, where do you go next? Sorry, you're kind of echoing. Where do you go next? What do you? What's oh. your next step? Yeah. So, uh, so I've got my new camera, my uh, my ZWO that um, has a just a ton of potential. So I'm uh, definitely going to start. Um, start really plugging away at doing that on the club's refractor. I'm going to set up my refractor a little more often this summer. I'm going to see if I can run my 8-inch Schmidt cast grain on my AVX mount with a guide scope on it. It's going to push the weight limit a little bit, but that's an experiment for the summer. Um, and then uh, eventually, next step is next big step is getting into narrow band imaging. Got to save up some money for some of those uh, pricey filters, but um, narrow band imaging is, is my next stop. You might also think about Pix Insight. I see your yes, yeah, yeah. I'm getting that. close to buying that. Yeah, <laughs> Deep Sky Stacker is starting to uh, show its its ragged edges. <laughs> I think they still offer a trial. Uh, am I right about that? Like, it's tough. Pix Insight trial is like I've, I've said it before on the channel. You cannot do enough in the time of the trial to learn how to use Pix Insight. Like there's just not, you're gonna try it, you're gonna say, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm never gonna figure this out. You kind of need to commit to it, but. Uh, yeah, actually your never give up attitude is gonna hold you in good stead with Pix Insight. And you can always ask one of us yeah. since we've all been through it. Maybe not so much for stacking and calibration if you're using batch pre-processing, um, which, is basically a deep sky stacker like pro, uh, uh, calibration and integration tool. Um, but then when you get into Pix Insight as a toolbox, uh, that's where it gets a little bit more complex, just figuring out their terminology for everything. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But but I love I love deep sky stacker. I grew up on deep sky stacker, and then uh, the the first few times I used the processing and Pix Insight, I was just kind of blown away. Still still brought it into Photoshop because that's what I was comfortable with, but just that stacking, uh, there's there's a reason they charge the big bucks for it. <laughs> yeah. So let me get my cat now, now, out of here. The mount story was uh, what clicked with me because I kind of went through the same thing uh, where your mount failed and you sent it over to get it fixed and you were down for such a long time. I think we all went through the same kind of. <laughs> yeah, it's been uh, it's been tough with all the mount woes, especially now that my my CGE Pro that was just it was already refurbished, it was already hyper tuned. In fact, I had talked to a, a Celestion rep when I was down at, at Texas Star Party to see if he had any advice on what might be going on with with the CGE Pro now. Uh, I'm having some weird issues with the declination axis. And he was just flabbergasted when I told him it had already been refurbished and it had already been hyper tuned like recently. And it's, you know, it's a, the mount, I think it only came out with it three years ago, so it can't be that old. And he was just flabbergasted, but it was having these troubles. <laughs> so uh, kind of a slew of bad luck with, with me on the on the heavy mounts. But uh, definitely, I, th I think I can get it fixed. It's, uh, it's in a better point than it was before Texas Star Party, but um, I'm gonna get back in touch with Dr. Clay and see what other advice he's got to offer me. Yeah, we've all chased those issues. That's uh, you almost have to convince yourself you're enjoying the troubleshooting, uh, right up until you get so frustrated you end up spending more money. <laughs> yeah, but at least have things to do in the meantime. You know, the AVX mount is going to be phenomenal, and then uh, the club's resource of of having that five inch refractor on the, it's on, I, I tested one time how long I could get that thing to guide for. And it was, it got up to 20 minutes before I gave up. So uh, mm. definitely some narrow band filters will probably start doing that on that mount just because it's already so stable, permanently polar aligned, et cetera. Uh, so at least have things to do in the meantime. So that's nice. Now uh, I noticed on your Borg, uh, on your, uh, I, I believe what you posted as the final image from the Borg, AVX Borg, with your DSLR, 
the stars in the corners seemed perfect. Yes. Whereas some of the prior images, uh, you even commented that uh, it didn't have a completely flat field. Was that, did you get a flattener of some sort or did you change anything or? Yeah, so I got a, so I was looking for field flatteners and Borg sells one, but uh, somebody on Cloudy Nights or something suggested that I get a, uh, a Hotec field flattener. They have one that's just like a general refractor field flattener works for refractors from like F4 to F7 or something like that. And it was half the price of the Borg one. It was only about 150 bucks. It screws directly onto that two inch threaded, was it the M48 type or I have to get all the numbers kind of mixed up, but um, uh, it screws directly on there. And then it has a two inch eyepiece barrel that fits into any like two inch eyepiece like uh, adapters. And yeah, just flat all the way to the edges, pinpoint perfect. Yeah. Awesome, looked, awesome flattener. It looked perfect, yeah. And I was surprised because you said uh, with the DSLR, I thought you were going to say with the CMOS, and then I was assuming it was maybe a smaller sensor. But when you said DSLR, I noticed immediately on that. Yeah, um, that's, it's a you know it's, I have, it's a crop sensor on my DSLR, but it's still quite large as far as um, right. astro cameras go. The ZWO also has a large chip, it's 16 megapixels, um, so it's it's almost the same field of view as as my DSLR actually. Hmm. Interesting. Now, I will say this, uh, you're planning on moving to narrowband and you're still using piggyback guiding, right? Uh, yes, and I know yeah. there's some problems with that. So, but so, I mean, yeah. that's what I'm gonna start with. Uh, so the mount, the, the uh, setup that the club has, um, it's not piggyback, but, but uh, what is it when they're both on the same, like saddle or they're side by side. Side by side, yeah. Um, and that, that setup is just extremely stable. Mm -hmm. um, so far, I haven't really tested how to um, guide on the AVX with the refractor on it yet um, as the primary telescope. With the, with, the small, with the larger field of view, it's a little more forgiving of, of, uh, of tracking and guiding errors. But I haven't really done a, a complete test to see how long I can do that for. But it probably won't quite be long enough. So I'll eventually have to do some kind of off-axis uh, solution, I think, and get a more sensitive guide camera but we'll cross that bridge when I get there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, when I was doing it uh, with an SCT, um, I could get like, on good nights, I could get about 12 minutes uh, piggyback guided. Uh, on the bad nights, it was like five minutes. And uh, the problem was you couldn't pick the good nights and the bad nights. So the nights you go out and really have an aggressive target, then those are the nights you have troubles. Um, of course. Yeah. So, or even worse, you're in Texas at the darkest skies you've ever seen. Or uh, for me, I'm at my club's observatory. Uh, can't even figure out which star's Polaris. I can see so many stars. But, um, and that's when you have that issue. So, keep, you already said it, you know, uh, eventually an off-axis guider might be in your future. I'm, I'm kind of an advocate of them, particularly with SCTs because, uh, there's a few other factors they have that just make piggyback guiding that much more difficult. Yeah, that primary mirror shift is a bear. I was imaging uh, the antenna galaxies at, at Texas Star Party last year and um, didn't check my frames often enough because I was up wandering the upper field. And the mirror had actually shifted drastically and they were completely out of focus the whole second half of the night. <laughs> so yeah, that it was my 11 inch astoundingly does not have a locking mirror, even though it mentions it specifically in the manual. So I guess I, I got a, one of their older ones before they put the locks on it or something. I don't entirely know, but uh, not having the locking mirror is uh, it's kind of sucks. <laughs> so if I get another STT in the future, <laughs> mirror locks, that's where it's at. Yeah. Well, you see, so that's the thing about the off-axis guider is uh, if you're using an off-axis guider, you don't have to lock the mirror because it will correct it as the mirror flops. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, the, uh, so a lot of us that use autofocus or uh, uh, a, uh, a motorized focuser won't lock the mirrors, we'll let that off-axis guider correct it and then be able to use the uh, autofocus without locking and unlocking the mirrors. Also so. on my shopping list, my ever growing shopping list. Of oh, it, it never very ends. Very familiar problem. <laughs> never ends. Yeah, I'm thinking like three years in. I you, I was a slow learner. Um, 
until I ended up getting my CCD camera, I really didn't like say, oh my God, oh my goodness, I'm really impressing myself here. Uh, I'm not just uh, jumping up and down because I got sharp stars in the corners. I'm like taking good photographs here. So uh, um, it's one of those things you just stick at it. You get better and better and better. And then uh, all of a sudden you can teach other people how to do it. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you had noticed any of the questions as we went through. I, I see we're five minutes over, so I'll try not to uh, uh, take too long. Were you using uh, any sort of uh, light pollution filter with your DSLR? Oh, yes. So all the ones – so I got a, an astronomic CLS filter pretty early on, um, uh, especially – so, so I have a – my 11-inch, when my uncle gave that to me, it came with an Orion – light pollution filter. I think it's an Orion. I can't remember if it's Orion or Mead. Um, and then I bought an astronomic CLS filter to go on, on the, uh, on the two inch adapter I have for the Vixen scope. And that's an absolute necessity <laughs> where I live at. And it really helps the DSLR pictures. The color balance is really screwy. So you have to have to go back and fix that after the fact, but, um, after some practice, it can, uh, it gets, it gets a little easier. Galaxies are still really hard for me to white balance, but I'm slowly getting better at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you have light pollution, that much more you'll appreciate narrow band. That's really all I can do these days uh, from home. Um, but uh, light pollution is no longer your, uh, your limiting factor when you're doing narrow band. Um, so I, I have I have that question that uh, Molly I'm gonna ask you I already asked you offline so I'm gonna ask you again so in front of everybody so uh, as a, a as a woman astro astrophotographer did you feel sometimes in the forums or in the star parties that were you were smothered by guys trying to help you uh, you know men men explaining you know wh whatever you call that uh, would you want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. So, so I'm a I'm a physicist, and uh, so I, I you know I've, I've gotten pretty used to being the only woman in the room a lot of the time. Um, but uh, I, on on my end, I have such a um, kind of outgoing personality that uh, I haven't had that ha happen too often. Uh, I do get some so I do get some really valuable help from uh, from like other astrophotographers in the club and from. Uh, some other people I've met at, at, at star parties and stuff like that, but um, I really haven't experienced too much of, of uh, what we call mansplaining <laughs> on that front where uh, you know, people think that I, that I don't know something, uh, assume I don't know something because I'm a, I'm a woman, but I've had that happen to me a little bit less than I hear other stories from my other female friends who've had that happen to them more. Um, but I, I do have to say that the, the culture is really changing and I've seen it in in my in my work life um i've seen you know people you, uh, make extra effort to use inclusive language um to make sure that they don't talk over me to uh uh you know to to show that they that they trust the things that i say uh the culture has really has really changed and there's still i still hear the stories of uh of women who um who still have people telling them like you know you shouldn't be in physics or i mean people have really heard this <laughs> even even to this day yeah. mm -hmm. um but uh the culture has definitely changed and yeah. it is changing you know, I, I witnessed this myself where you know somebody somebody would come to the r observatory and they would just run out of there because of the attention it's not a bad type of attention it's just too much of it you know guys are all around oh this is saturn it has moons and da, da, da. you just just keep going on and on and i see uh, women just running out of there. <laughs> yeah, I uh, you know maybe maybe I just don't see it about because I'm so used to to working with a lot of guys. Um, but uh, yeah, I can definitely. Uh, sometimes I have been in conversations where it's like, all right, cool, okay, thanks, but I got it, you know. So it, it happens occasionally, but um, uh, not not too often actually, which which is good. Thank you. I'm just uh, reading through. I think we, uh, yeah, a lot of people have that same comment. They, uh, it's a familiar story. Everyone's, everyone's gone through it. Uh, uh, someone's trying to spend a lot more of your money and they're suggesting Astrodon filters. Uh, 
Uh, <laughs> yeah. With, if you have the money, are definitely worth it. But uh, for me, it took an extra two years of saving. So. Yeah, you know, if I, I'll, I'm going to keep uh, submitting images for imaging awards and maybe use some of that money toward, <laughs> toward that, that end. So uh, who knows? And then just, you know, saving up money for, for gear as time goes on. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah, it sounds like you got lucky with a lot of your gear. Well, yeah. lucky and unlucky. It's pretty insane. Uh, just, I, I mean, I, I look at look at all the gear that I have, and uh, I've bought, let's see, I've bought the ZWO camera, and I've bought both of my DSLRs. And everything else has either been sold to me for a really steep discount or just straight up given to me. And I own four telescopes, three mounts. Uh, oh, I want a pair of overwork binoculars, uh, 45 by 70s at a, <laughs> at a star party. <laughs> you know, it's just that I just kind of had like, it was, so some crazy luck and some really generous friends and family. Um, I think, I think actually, you know, because I'm young and female, people in the club like to support me uh, and, and my, my, my passion for astrophotography and uh, been given some really awesome equipment and sold some stuff for cheap and, um, people really like to like to support me in that way. So that's been a big part of it too. Yeah. I think that's something, uh, that speaks to the kind of the community is, uh, we're, we're in it for fun, but it's also knowledgeable. And if you can share the knowledge, then, uh, you're basically having fun. You know, even Tolga talks about, uh, it's said about people kind of over being overbearing, I guess you would say. And I like to say to myself, you know, when someone shows interest in astrophotography, I'm overbearing because i'm excited about it and all of a sudden uh this person that i don't have anything to talk about uh we have something to talk about and it doesn't matter whether it's your neighbor or someone you just happen to see uh all of my neighbors all of my all of my friends uh particularly at my lake house where i do some photography and they see my setup and all they say oh where's the telescope you have it out what do you what have you shot recently and they just want to talk about it so it, it's definitely a good conversation for both people into it and people who are just kind of so-so into it, who maybe uh, get their astronomy from uh, the, from TV or from the cosmos or from uh, whatever whatever medium it is that they're, they're on. Um, yeah, I found that some of my family, they, they'll read my blog and say like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but awesome, you know, and they'll just still keep reading it. Um, or, you know, when there's somebody, we have some people in the club who have now become more interested in astrophotography because I've been doing it and, uh, my minion Michaela has been doing it and we've had a few other people start start doing it and posting their images a lot more often and it's kind of starting to spread and I think uh, sometimes like, I get so into talking about it then yeah I'll also sometimes just go way overboard on details but uh, communicating science concepts is something that uh, I, I think that I'm good at and I kind of skimmed over a lot I've just kind of used a lot of, of jargon in that talk I guess but um, you know so when I'm teaching somebody new then it is a lot of information, but uh, they're really receptive of it just because it's such a cool, cool hobby. And a lot of people kind of want to get into it now that te the technology is so enabling. Yes. It, yeah. yeah. Our, our cameras are better than the cameras that uh, went up with Hubble originally, right? Our, our sensors are our, our DSLR sensors. And uh, maybe they weren't uh, specifically designed that way, but... Um, the technology enables everything. Um, I'm sorry, I'm reading this backwards. Okay, about a light pollution filter that's more uh, that avoids uh, the new LEDs, which they had installed on my block recently, and then they expanded them down my block, but doesn't seem to be making a huge difference. I do have some uh, trees in between me and the street lights, so I haven't noticed anything yet. Yeah, the LEDs, um, especially when cities are selling the more bluer ones instead of the more redder ones, um, you know, the like my CLS, my astronomic CLS filter has a notch in it for for sodium pressure lamp light. You know, kind of that yellowish light. Um, but when you have these broad spectrum blue, like, you know, 5,000 K color temperature lights, you know, you're, you're, you're 
got the same light that is in these street lights that is actually the same light that you want to image. So you, um, that's definitely a lot harder. Um, but uh, that's why the people, organizations like the International Dark Sky Association are encouraging uh, cities to install much redder lights because a they don't scatter off the atmosphere so much. Um, and then of course all the all the health benefits of not having bright blue light when you're trying to sleep, and of course all the w wildlife benefits and stuff too. But it is more blockable as well by uh, by light pollution filters when you get into that more. Uh, yellow, red, kind of similar to the sodium pressure lamp mm. color ranges. The only benefit I could see with the new ones is they're they're definitely shielded better. Because um, I used to be able to see line of sight the street lights, and now I can't see line of sight the street lights. Um, but uh, and they they don't quite seem brighter. It might be the shielding, but they kind of the way they illuminate the road. I'm a little bit more optimistic than I'd been just reading about them because uh, I was afraid that uh, I was afraid basically I was going to lose my entire southern view which would kind of devastate uh, my yeah, cities cities are starting like they'll, they'll look and see how what other cities have done and how people have reacted to having like if you put in like you know a 50 watt LED light where you had a 50 watt um, incandescent before the 50 watt LED is putting out way more light <laughs> than the 50 watt incandescent. Uh, so, uh, but cities are starting to realize this. Like they'll they'll look at other cities and see what they've done and, and have the residents complain about the lights being too bright, too blue. Um, so, and uh, and then of course the International Dark Sky Association kind of having their effect uh, by sending people out to city councils and um, getting more of the knowledge out there on how a redder light is actually better for you and you don't have to have nearly so much wattage. It's all about lumens. You have to think about lumens instead of wattage and kind of getting that information out there and more cities are starting to hear that either from them or just from other cities who have tried it and have ran into problems. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not saving money on power costs by switching to LEDs, you're doing something wrong. We did it at, at my business and the savings is so huge. Uh, first to CFLs, and my father was always uh, uh, a stickler over it. He's like, oh, but these bulbs are 17 cents and these bulbs are $3. Why would you buy the $3 bulb? And it's like, lights are on eight hours a day, uh, longer than eight hours a day, every day. Look at the power consumption. It's going to pay for itself in six months. Uh, and then LEDs, and it's, again, the same exact thing. Um, so it was... Uh, they're, they're here to stay. They uh, just have to work on the, the spectrum that they're putting out if they um, if they care about keeping the ast astrophotographers happy. Well, even if they don't care about keeping the astrophotographers happy, there's a, you know um, there's a lot of research in uh, in in sleep, uh, human health, like uh, cancer causing um, problems of having blue lights on at night in your neighborhood, uh, wildlife or um, in, or crime rates and stuff too. I've, the International Dark Sky Association has some interesting studies that they've collected on their website about how when you have um, lights that aren't properly shielded, then you, the police actually have a harder time following per perpetrators uh, because they can't see because <laughs> the light's blinding them. So even if they don't care about astronomy at all, there's tons of other good reasons yeah. to have shielded, redder lights in their city uh, and dimmer ones. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you, Molly. I know we've gone uh, 20 minutes over, but we, we love having uh, different perspectives on astrophotography. And the newbie's perspective is always one that I really like hearing. Uh, you know, we all, uh, we all have the same uh, idea in mind, that the journey that gets us there is going to be slightly different for everyone. And uh, just hearing one other person's experiences, um, really, uh, really, really exciting. Uh, so thank you. Um, next week, uh, I believe Gaston Baudet is on again for auto guiding uh, techniques and the how to get the most out of your system. Um, so uh, if you want to know how to improve your auto guiding, he's, this is that's the session to see. And uh, as always, Gaston's great presenter. Um, I'm sorry, I've got that one for mounting. Uh, 
Glass or metal photo mounts, are you asking about how to mount them? I think we're going to take this one in chat, George. Um, so I do want to thank you all uh, for coming. Um, and again, thanks, Molly. Uh, thanks so much for having me. No problem. Uh, see you all next week, and good night.